Good evening, everyone. My name is Ayana Kennedy, and I am a second year student at the Wharton School. I am so excited to have you all join us today. On this bright and sunny day, for anyone who is sitting at the, in Philly, we really appreciate that you have joined. As we wrap up our MBA's Week of Diversity and Inclusion, one Wharton week, and start our undergrad week of diversity and inclusion with We Dig. We thought it would be an amazing opportunity to sit down with our Dean, Dean James, to discuss why DEI matters at Wharton. Today, you will hear from a panelist of students in an honest and candid conversation with Dean James on where Wharton stands on DEI and also get the student's perspective. We will all introduce ourselves and then we will get into the questions that you guys are probably interested in hearing about. As stated, I'm a second year student at Wharton as well as a dual degree student at the Graduate School of Education pursuing education entrepreneurship. I am also from Bowie, Maryland and I attended North Carolina A&T State University for undergrad and majored in electrical engineering. I am one of the co-presidents of Return on Equality, which is our Wharton side MBA DNI organization. Why DEI matters to me is because I was tired of being the only one in the room as a black female engineer for so many years. I wanted to be the rule and not the exception. And as I worked in a place where I didn't feel that that was valued for years, I wanted to make it my mission to make sure that I'm making an impactful change in my career progression. I will now pass it over to Ryan, one of our undergrad students. Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Pruitt. I'm a Wharton senior and I'm a part of We Dig and I'm leading the We Dig Week initiative that's next week. And I have an awesome team behind me and everyone should go to the We Dig Week next week and the events are gonna be amazing. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I identify as a, a black American man. I am passionate about DEI because I recognize that there are systems in place in our world that weren't really made for everyone. And I think if we work together, we can innovate those systems to make the world a better place. Hi, everyone. My name is Sonali Salgado. My pronouns are she, her. I'm one of the co-presidents of Return on Equality and a second year MBA student at Warden who's also pursuing uh, a degree at Penn GSC as well in education policy. And as for why I'm interested in DEI, I am the daughter of Sri Lankan immigrants to the United States. And for me, I've just been most comfortable in my own skin when I've been in spaces where diversity is celebrated and cultural difference is celebrated. And so at Warden and in my work before Warden, I've tried my best to pay that favor forward and create spaces where all of us can celebrate our diversity. And with that, I would pass it on to Danny. Hi, everyone. I'm Danny Mendelssohn. I'm a senior in the undergrad level, and I'm from London. My pronouns are he and him. And I'm really passionate about DI. It stems from my mother, who's always been a big advocate for equality in the workplace and also just to be an ally to those that need it. And she really showed me the importance of joining the conversation. And I've learned that through my privilege, how important it is for me to join those conversations. And so, I'm also one of the co-founders of WEDIC at the undergrad level. I will now pass it on to Karen. Yeah, hi everyone, really excited to be here. My name's Karen. I am one of the board members of the Warden Equity, Diversity and Inclusion group at an undergrad level. I'm a senior and warden and my pronouns are she, her. I identify as a first generation low income Latina and I'm very passionate about D, 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 E, and I because I, Grew up and went to high school and I really feared about how I would fit in um, going to an elite institution like Penn and Warden. And I really want people to not fear that and to continue making space um, for others after me to feel comfortable on thriving these spaces and make their voice heard. It's extremely important. And I'm gonna pass it up to Kara. 
Hi, my name is Cara Murray Bedell. Um, I, along with Sonali Nayana, am one of the co-presidents of Return on Equality. I'm feeling really good because Ryan has a whole week ahead of him and I have a whole week behind me, so that's exciting. Um, let's see, she, there's my pronoun, is from Oakland, California. Um, and um, I've got passionate about DNI largely because of my upbringing there. I'm obsessed with my city. Uh, my parents are divorced, and so I grew up kind of on two different sides of Oakland and saw really clearly the um, discrepancies of resources and how they impact people. And it really affirmed for me that there's like an Aboriginal quote about how if you've come to help, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your your fate or your justice or your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And so I think I saw that really firsthand and I've been super passionate about creating those like equitable communities ever since. Um, Dean James, I have the first question for you. I will ask you the question, but I also want to, um, of course, give you time to introduce yourself. So I will ask the question. And if you want to also throw a, an introduction, although I think most of the students know who you are, <laughs> that would be lovely. Um, but you started your deanship in a turbulent time between COVID-19 and the highly publicized, well-known killings of, an un of unarmed Black people in America. What was it like trying to foster a sense of community in response to these challenges, despite being a new dean who was working virtually? Well, thank you, Cara, and thank you all, uh, both our undergraduate and MBA students for pulling this together. I am really, really thrilled to be a part of this conversation, but more importantly, to see the leadership that exists within the student community on such an important topic. Uh, I'm also really glad that the undergraduate and MBA students are working together on something, because I really think that it is in community and in strength of numbers that we can really also see and, and affect change. So I'm, I'm thrilled for this opportunity. Um, so as introduction, yes, Erica James, Dean of the Wharton School, my pronouns are she and her. And uh, I'll answer the question everyone else did, which is, you know, why is DEI important to me? Uh, some of you have may, may have heard my story growing up, uh, product of divorced parents, both of my parents who are black married someone who was white. Uh, my stepfather is white and Jewish, so I feel like I have had the experience of living and navigating across at least racial boundaries for, a, for quite some time. Um, and I actually think it's the skill that I developed to do that uh, that has led to um, growth in my own leadership. So I, I want to ensure that as the world becomes more diverse and as the world becomes more global, one of the things that I'm passionate at, at for Wharton is to be a place where we can provide uh, opportunities for developing one's leadership to navigate and lead in diverse, in diverse worlds. So that's why it's important to me personally and what I'm trying to do within the Wharton School. So to your question about my journey, uh, I, would, I would say I was not intending to be in higher education. This wasn't the career path I set out on when I was you know, a, a, a kid or a teenager, uh, but I really loved being in school and apparently never wanted to leave school. So I got every degree I could get along a particular trajectory and realized at the end of it that that PhD was preparing me to be in higher education and to be a faculty member. And even though over the years there have been opportunities for me to step outside of that, I can't think of another place or way that I would like to have impact and in particular, as we're talking about matters of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I started at Wharton last summer. Uh, I moved to Philadelphia weeks after all of the uh, race protests were happening around the country. They were also happening in Center City, Philadelphia, which I did not have a chance to visit before uh, selecting an apartment. And I remember moving in that first weekend and everything was boarded up. And I remember the graffiti on the, on the boards all throughout Center City. And I, I remember that I, I live right by City Hall. And so that the protests that were happening and the police were just out in force every night. And it felt almost like a war zone. And I, I recognize that we have been Perhaps people on this call have actually been in war zones, so that's probably not a fair comparison, but it was unlike anything I had experienced before in this country, just the, the desolate nature, knowing that that was precipitated by really heinous acts of violence. So in coming into this role, although I had not intended to spend as much time initially putting race at the forefront of, of my time as Dean, I didn't know how I could not do that 
given the circumstances. And I needed to understand where Wharton was in its evolution of DE&I. And part of that meant I needed to have conversations with people who could share with me what is in the Wharton community's mind following the deaths of uh, Breonna Taylor and, and um, George Floyd and, and sadly too many others. So I started with conversations with uh, student leaders. I started with um, meeting with our staff. I started with meeting with faculty and we were talking and, and some of our board members and we were talking about these issues. Um, and it helped provide a grounding for me of what mattered, what people cared about. And it also helped to sort of fight some stereotypes that I had about the Wharton community coming in as I saw people's um, eagerness to talk about these issues. So I will ask you all a question and it's in a similar vein. Uh, you all were here and experienced 2020 like the rest of us. And I'm wondering what you all saw as sort of challenges uh, as you all lived through that. And actually we're reliving it again now, if you watch the news, knowing that the Chauvin trial is going on, um, it feels like even in a more heinous way, we're seeing the imagery of that over and over. And that has to affect, that has to affect you. So I'm, I'd love to hear you all talk about your experiences in the midst of this. Yeah, so I'll take that one. I think for from the MBA perspective, I can at least speak for, it was hard, right? Like we were all on spring break and kind of trying to enjoy our time um, and kind of waiting to see what was happening in March, April timeframe, right? When COVID really hit us. Um, and I don't think we fully actualized what this would mean. I think we were at a point of, you know, it'll be a couple of weeks. We'll definitely be back on campus soon. Uh, and that didn't happen, right? So we fully transitioned to a virtual setting, uh, Q4 of 2020. And we've, while we've integrated the hybrid model, right, we have not been fully back on campus since then. Um, and so in the midst of our first year, that was definitely a blow to us, right? Uh, I can definitely talk about like class, classmates experiences and, and heartaches and ups and downs with that. Right. I know people want to talk about like, you know, these are what you would call champagne problems, right? Um, at the end of the day, uh, there are definitely bigger issues happening outside. And we very much so understand that we're in our Wharton bubble. But for us, this this was impactful, right? This is not what we at all imagined it would be when we all decided to pick up and leave our jobs, uh, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, so it was definitely a challenge and it still is at times like maneuvering the online learning right and we hit the summer and then black lives the black lives matter movement hits and I know for Sonali Kara and I, you know, we were hitting the ground running with making sure we could work with you know WGA our student government to make sure that we could be there for our black community as much as possible right as three females of color leading the D, the DNI organization, it was very important to us to make sure that students' voices were heard throughout this, these injustices. And I think we've tried to incorporate that throughout the whole year. Um, and I think people have been responsive to it. They have been very much appreciative of how much work I would say that Wharton has done to be there for its students, uh, as well as faculty has done so. And you know, while we're still navigating this this Zoom world, right? Of course, we Zoom fatigue. Everyone has it at this point. Being on a on a camera screen for hours at a time has definitely been overwhelming. I think we are trying to find you know the glass half full in this journey. Um, and I know I know it might be a little different from the undergrad perspective. So I'd definitely love to hear you guys. Yeah, I can I can add to that. I mean, I think we we sort of experience similar challenges and a good way I would describe it is is almost what we learned in our marketing classes. So as soon as spring break hit, it was like cognitive overload almost because you're making so many decisions at once. And it's almost felt like we've been doing that for months on end, you know, in terms of taking care of loved ones. I've heard of peers who have had family members that have had like mental health crises. 
Um, you know, we, we know that mental health has plummeted just because we spent so many months in our homes cooped up and we have tried to stay together while apart, but I think just the weeks and days of, of making so many decisions um, was definitely really stressful at an undergrad level in that sense. Um, and adding to what Ayana was saying, I mean, as people of color, I think we, we did step up in the warden community and, and WEDIG was created at, at the right time. And we've helped community forums for, for the Asian community within warden um, and also for the black community. Um, but you know, it's, it's just painful. Um, and I think it's almost, I have the anecdote of like where you're like a chef cooking and, and you're cooking different things at once, struggling to make sure that they don't burn. And I think that's what the pandemic for me personally and, and hearing my peers, that's what it's felt like just sort of juggling a ton of things, making sure that nothing catches on fire, um, trying to be, you know, daughters, sons, brothers, sisters, classmates, uh, professionals. I think it's been extremely hard, but, you know, we're, we're thankfully, you know, you know, not everyone can say that, but we're all here on the Zoom call. Thankfully, we're healthy. Um, and I think we, we've all learned a lot throughout this journey. Definitely. I think Ayana and Karen both put it amazing. Um, it, from my experience, it definitely feels like a constant battle of running around putting out fires every day. But to move on to the next question, Dean James, you mentioned that you spent your first months of being Dean going around speaking to students and faculty. I wonder what have you learned from your conversations and what are some of your near and long-term goals for, for DEI? For yeah. So, yeah, I, I mentioned in my previous response that some of what I learned about Wharton really surprised me in, in tremendous ways. So I knew Wharton's reputation. I knew the perception that existed about Wharton, that it was a finance school, that it tended to attract um, white men who were interested in going into finance. And then after that, sort of consulting, that was sort of, that's the image of the Wharton school by those who aren't in it. And then I had a chance to be in it and get to know the community and who's here. And we have allowed ourselves to be so really short on having that as our singular perception that's out in the, in the universe, because there is so much more to this community, both in terms of the career diversity that exists and what people come into Wharton with had the backgrounds that they have. And what they choose to do once they leave Wharton is so much more than just finance and consulting. And I don't think that the rest of the world understands that. I was ill prepared for the level of activity that our faculty are already doing around research connected to equity, diversity. Um, it, is, it is phenomenal to me. And if there is another school on the planet that can hold a candle to the volume of work that our faculty are doing in these areas, I, I'd like to see that because I, I, I don't believe it. So that was shocking to me. Um, the more I've inter interacted with students, the more I realize that this is an incredibly diverse community of students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Yes, by uh, demographic characteristics that you can see on the surface, but also by the experiences that they bring here and the, the professional journeys that they are choosing to take. And I think um, I'm really excited to tell, to enhance the narrative of Wharton so that we can continue to ensure that we're attracting all of the students who want to be here, because I suspect there are people who are turned off because of a false narrative or an insufficient narrative, I'll, I'll say. Uh, and I think that's same with the faculty and the staff that are recruited here. We want them to fully appreciate all of what Wharton is, and we need to find a way to expound beyond the, the, current, the current perception. Um, my goals for DEI, there, there are many. Um, I want to really capitalize on the work that the students are leading. So we dig ROE and, and others, even in non-diversity oriented student clubs, um, every one of them that I've spoken with has an initiative connected to, to DEI. And so wanting to ensure that we can support those efforts, wanting to ensure that the programs themselves uh, have what they need 
both in terms of the curriculum, but also in terms of ensuring that uh, the, the non-academic experiences are supportive of and integrated from a diversity standpoint. So, so that's another goal. So um, I will ask the next question. And that is, so again, following on what your question was for me, Ryan, what are your, as students, what are your, what do you think Wharton's priorities should be as it connects to, to, w, to DEI? And I'm really curious from the undergraduates to understand, you know, how did We Dig come about? What prompted you to start We Dig? And then for the MBA students, sort of how would you characterize the opportunities that exist for MBAs to really enhance diversity? Sure, I can kick us off and then uh, throw it to the undergrads to talk about the creation of WeDig. I think from an MBA perspective, I mean, so much of what you said, Dean James, really resonates with what MBAs want to focus on. Um, you know, at the, at the start of the conversation, you talked about how much eagerness there was, perhaps a surprising level, to talk about DEI issues at Warden among staff and faculty. And that's something that Ayana, Kara, and I have also seen throughout the year. I mean, in the past couple of weeks, so many people have reached out around, how should I respond in, uh, to the shootings at Atlanta? How could I be there for Asian American members of my class? And similarly, people reached out after the highly publicized killings of unarmed black men over the summer. So definitely people uh, have that eagerness. I think sometimes we've seen MBA students not have the right vocabulary, which is part of what drives that outreach. They just don't have, sometimes they don't have the tools and ROE and WGA try to create as much as possible those types of spaces where we can facilitate this dialogue and empower people to have these conversations and to understand how to navigate conversations that are often difficult. Um, but I would say that we are two student organizations. And with that in mind, I think there needs to continue to be investment from the Office of Student Life in creating these spaces. We have conversations that matter, which OSL started uh, to, to fill this need, but that's a priority, I think we would say from a student life perspective. And then from an academic perspective, I think your vision for uh, incorporating DEI into the classroom really resonates. I think we've seen MBA students talk about uh, how equity could perhaps be woven in more thoroughly to classes, not just the ones that you self-select, into, but the core curriculum as well. Um, and I think I've, I think we are living in a moment where people are questioning, how do you make the economy work for everyone? And as future business leaders, that's a question that we want to be able to answer. How do I think through taxes are an expense, but taxes also fund so many public services. Um, we have a responsibility not only to shareholders, but also to stakeholders. Some classes do obviously focus on that, but I think there's an appetite to see that woven in more thoroughly to the academic experience. And it, and it looks like Warden is moving in that direction, which is very exciting. So it, before, before we get to, to we dig, I just wanna follow up on that one point because one of the things that you've said about the MBA students, perhaps not having the vocabulary to talk about these difficult conversations, one of the things that is also true is our faculty don't oftentimes have the vocabulary to talk about these conversations in the classroom. And while they can, they can research these ideas and, and know how to you know, frame an academic paper around inequality in the housing market, having that conversation in class oftentimes feels risky because they, many of them lack the, the, the experience in those conversations and it's a fearful thing for them to, to do. And so just as our students are needing to navigate and learn how to have these conversations, part of what we have to do on the faculty side is create opportunities for faculty to learn how to, how to have and lead these conversations so that it's more comfortable for them to incorporate into their, into their content. Yeah, I really appreciate that point. I mean, I think something that we'll talk about perhaps later on in this conversation is around faculty diversity and getting more representation among faculty members. But even if you're from the dominant group, 
we would still hope that you would feel comfortable and have the vocabulary to have these very important conversations in the classroom. So um, we really appreciate that point. We dig. Yes, um, I can speak about we dig. And I think to that final point as well, going back to the kind of first question, one of the things people learned over the summer was how little they knew. So I think it's been great to see kind of people educate themselves more and start to learn more about to have these conversations and that, you know, it's okay to be uncomfortable because that shows the progress that is being made. But to move it on to why we did was started, it all kind of started back in spring 2019 when we analyzed some student data and found kind of common trends along the workplace and other universities was that historically underrepresented students had lower satisfaction throughout their four years at Wharton. And it was, how do we go about solving this problem? So Nia Robinson, who's now a junior at Wharton and the co-chair of the Wharton Dean's Undergraduate Advisory Board, put together an initiative team that I was grateful to be on of Wharton student leaders to try and find a solution to this, to this challenge. And we found, you know, this isn't something that you can slap a band-aid on and will go away. And this isn't kind of a one solution scenario where one thing will, will solve everything. So we came up with three different implementation models. One was to bring in a diversity dean, dean of diversity or an office of sorts. The second was to create a student organization that was administration sponsored that would look at everything. And the third was to do a steering committee. And after talking a lot between ourselves as a team, we found that we know students best. We are students. We have been in these student groups. And there was, you know, some sort of ownership, but also we knew we could get that done. So we ended up going for the implementation model around creating a student organization and started going working with the undergraduate division on how this would work, how this would look, how it would fit in, how funding would happen. And about 15 months after this team started, we were able to create WeDig to solve kind of all uh, satisfaction kind of related issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion to help also support the affinity clubs and groups that were kind of more pre-professional focused and about how to support people post graduation, but not so much about how to best experience whilst they're at the school. So that was why we was created. And thankfully it was created in April, just before everything over the summer. And the first set of co-chairs and Javin and Soda did a great job kind of navigating those conversations and creating those spaces for people to talk about the events of last summer. Thanks for sharing that. I think you're the the other part of your question was kind of about like interest from the the Wharton from the the for the Wharton community about diversity and inclusion and so maybe uh, maybe I can take some of that and then if someone from the undergrad side wants to hop in too, and I think you're you're absolutely right in saying that there is more appetite for diversity and inclusion here than I think maybe. Uh, we give credit for. I think part of the issue and I think part of the perception is that it still sometimes feels like kind of a dominant culture exists at Wharton. Um, and so it's like, even though, the, you know, the majority of the school is not white men, <laughs> it feels like because of that history and I think because of that culture, there's just something here that kind of like makes that the dominant thing. And I think, especially when issues of, of diversity come up and things start to, um, to percolate in the community, sometimes the feelings of the dominant group get prioritized over the feelings of the majority. And that's something that I think um, um, I've kind of battled as a student here. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, I think there are, is a lot of interest, but there also is a lot of, um, a lot happening at Wharton that's happening in the rest of the world, which is that we get siloed and we end up hanging out with people who look like us and um, who we feel comfortable around, which is crazy because I think Wharton's maybe one of the most diverse places I've ever been in my whole life, certainly in terms of the amount of international students, which is amazing. And it's like, we get here and then we just hang out with the people who look like us. And like, I'm super grateful that Wharton actually has a black community. I think a lot of back business schools do not. Um, and I'm super grateful to have that space. And I think it's an important space that every student should be able to have. And at the same time, I really, um, I guess I wish there were more opportunities for cross-cultural collaboration and more support for like building those cross-cultural relationships and more vocal push from the administration and from every part of the, the community about how to do that. And I will say, you know, I, I think there are some amazing professors here. Professor Rachel Arnett gave a talk earlier today um, and she spoke really beautifully about, um, you know, being scared of what you said, scared of messing up and scared of looking bad. And, you know, you may be talking to the next Elon Musk so you don't wanna say the wrong thing. Um, and But I think like that is a thing that we all have to get over. And I think I wish Wharton professors were more open with the fact that they don't know everything uh, when it comes to these issues and that we can have a conversation together. And of course, I wish the faculty looked more like me and more like Karen and Sonali and um, that we got to see ourselves reflected more often in the in the faculty. 
Um, and I was a little sad about like, you know, the, our teaching excellence professor is amazing and he's trying really hard, but he also has a unique perspective that is his own. So um, yeah, those are my thoughts about it. So I think people are interested and also, um, of course, there's more work to do because the world still has more work to do. <laughs> We're always going to be doing this work. Yeah. Randy, you do want to hop on that? Yeah, and I, I agree. I think, I think it's getting better. I think, um, for, especially from the undergrad level, I think Warden is a very diverse place, but it's often very siloed. Even sometimes as a black man, I, I feel not as comfortable to articulate my experience. And I think moving forward, if we can articulate these uh, values of DEI and in our curriculum, we can get more people to have uh, these authentic conversations with, another, with one another. And literally, kind of like Card mentioned, uh, have these cr cross-cultural conversations with different groups in, in our school and literally prep the leaders of tomorrow to make the world a more inclusive, equitable, and diverse place. So I definitely think it's getting better, especially knowing the history of Penn and Wharton. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And I think now more than ever, people are, are, are very willing and open to learning these new ideas and uh, figuring out together how we can make the world a better place. So if I could just ask a quick follow on, and I'm, I'm almost every conversation I've had with students has been very open and receptive to discussions of diversity. But I can't tell if, if I'm just interacting with the choir, those who are already invested in this work, or if it really is representative of the broader Wharton community. And if it's not, is there some way that I can and should be reaching other groups of students that, that might feel less uh, comfortable sort of engaging in these kinds of, of conversations. I can't get a feel for whether this is just the self-selected group versus the dominant culture. I, I can hop in. I think I uh, part of me wants to say it's a bit of a self-selected group. I feel like there's a notion where a lot of people think that uh, if we increase DNI, that that's just like splitting uh, the piece of the, the pie more. But I think really, I think it's Warden's job to make students realize where if we increase D and I, that's literally expanding the pie even bigger so people can have like seconds and as many slices as they want. Um, so I wanna say that it's kind of, I personally think it's a little, it's a little self-selected. And I think it goes back to your point before Dean James, I think certain students are scared to speak up about these types of experiences. Anyone from the MBA have wanna offer a perspective on this? I'll, I'll chime in. I think like I second everything <laughs> Ryan is saying. So from our side, I will say when you look at the people that are really, you know, on the front lines working DEI initiatives within Wharton probably already have that, you know, itch within them, right? And they really are working these two years to make a difference. Um, even from, you know, we have one class, right, for DNI. That's Professor Stephanie Query's class. Uh, and I was lucky enough to not only take the class, but I was the TA for the class as well. And if you look at the class representation, I mean, it was definitely not the, the cisgender straight white male that was in the classroom, right? Like it was just not representative on the undergrad side and on the MBA side. Too. And so most people are taking these classes to kind of further where their learnings already are and because they're already passionate about it. And I think we have these conversations at the MBA side all the time, Sonali, Cara and I, have, okay, how do we get people interested in this, right? Like during one Wharton week this week, we really tried to have as many diverse panels as possible, right? Like, is there a way to get the upper echelon white male to be represented on a panel, right? On socioeconomic diversity, for instance. Um, so I think we're trying to make those strides, but it does seem to be similar to what Ryan said on the undergrad experience. Yeah, and I will say that our, our attendance at the events this past week, there's not been a lot of white man attendance. And I know they're out there. Yeah. I see them in class, yeah. so I know they- Exactly. <laughs> exactly, Cara, exactly. <laughs> but I wonder, I mean, your question was also like, where do you find them? I mean, I'd be really interested to like, if you went to you know a finance club meeting and started bringing up these issues, how they would how they would talk about it. And I, I don't know the answer to that question, but you know, obviously they are part of social clubs like hockey and part of finance club and whatever uh, management club. And so I'd be super curious, like in those settings, how they would react to a conversation about this if you uh, were there with them. 
Yeah, I would echo both of Ayana and Kara's sentiments. I think that a lot of these DNI conversations and classes are often, and to some extent, we are preaching to the choir. It is, we are always cognizant of how could we expand and reach out to more students? How could we cut this question from different perspectives? Like maybe have an analytics event, which we did this week to try to pull in uh, more folks than maybe if we focused on the more touchy feely side of DNI, which we did today with our, our conversations across different panel. But it is something that we are cognizant of um, and trying to do from the bottom up. But I think if we really want all students to graduate with this education and how to manage across diversity, then there, there needs to be more top down guidance on how to launch this more universally at Warden, which it sounds like Warden, you know, is moving in that direction. And that's great. Um, but this is also actually a great segue to our, our next question, which is around as Warden launches these various initiatives, uh, how will we go from an abstract high level goal to tangible initiatives and perhaps even metrics that will be tracked going forward. We often say in the MBA program, probably in the undergrad program as well, you can't manage what you don't measure. So on that note, how, how do you hope Warden will measure and track success on these initiatives? Yeah, so there are, I think of this in terms of the different stakeholders that are part of the Wharton community. So several of you have already mentioned faculty and faculty representation and wanting to see faculty that look like you in the front of the classroom. And, and as someone who's gone through a lot of education myself, you know, I had the same desire. I, I don't think maybe in college I had one or two black faculty my entire four years. Um, and so there is an opportunity to work to enhance the representation of the faculty that are here. Uh, and that includes having diverse faculty across as many of the departments that exist. You know, as Wharton is similar to many other business schools where faculty in management tend to be more diverse than, for example, faculty in, in, in finance or operations. And part of that is, you know, there are more folks of color who are getting degrees in management or strategy than they are in operations or finance, or, or finance but that's not an excuse for us to help build a pipeline by starting earlier in the pipeline. So our doctoral program actually is really committed to creating uh, ways for more young college students to learn about the pathway to get a PhD, because once you're on that pathway, then you are eligible to become a faculty member. And so that's where we can sort of um, help facilitate a, 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 the growth in the pipeline of, of future faculty who are faculty of color. Um, so that's, that's one area. Are we growing the pipeline and are we growing the, num the, the number of diverse faculty represented in the Wharton community? On the student side, one of the things, again, so pleasantly surprised, not only because of the effort of the student leaders, but at the programmatic level, um, there's real commitment to this work as well. I've spent a lot of time working with uh, Vice Dean Robertson at the undergraduate level. She has an entire strategic plan that's you know, being implemented over a period of years that is really about creating a diverse and equitable environment so that our students can thrive while they're here. Um, some of that work is also happening at the at the MBA level. And so um, to the extent that we can put, to your point, Sonali, real metrics so that we know that 2023 is better than 2021, either because we have a more representative class or because we've offered diversity content in a bigger percentage of the curriculum. Those are the kinds of things that... Um, or be, that we are able to get more members of the uh, sort of non-diverse community engaged in diversity activities and programming and, and, and leadership roles. Those would be ways in which I'm thinking about how do we measure the success of Wharton going forward in this, in this area. So I'll turn the table and ask you all, how, how would you define success? You'll graduate in the next you know, months to year or two, um, how would you define 
success for Wharton when you come back for reunion in five years? What would you be looking for that's different? I could take that. Um, I would say what I would be looking for that would be different, definitely incorporating uh, what I mentioned before, just having students understand the value of DEI and literally incorporating those lessons in, for example, like the Warden 101 class or the Warden Leadership Venture class that student um, the the students take every every year. Um, but I think beyond that, I think it's important to to recognize, um, especially for the administration, to recognize that Warden is literally a thought leader. Like from alumni like Elon Musk and Warren Buffett and other notable alumni, the Wharton curriculum really shapes um, the future generations. And I think it's important to recognize that if we get these students, if we get students to have these authentic conversations now in undergrad, then when you know they're starting the net next like Facebook they'll be more educated about these issues. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I echo 100% what Ryan just said. I would love to see Warden realize its potential to be a thought leader in this space and you know, maybe even have a global conference the way that our real estate center has a global conference that's well recognized in the industry. I would love to see Warden do that. And then I think Tangibly, if I were to come back in five years, I know that the pipeline problem that you mentioned is, is a steep one, a challenging one to address, but I would hope that we do have uh, a higher percentage of women, a higher percentage of people from underrepresented, historically underrepresented groups in the United States on faculty, um, as well as a, a higher percentage of faculty members from emerging markets. I think that uh, perhaps hasn't been talked enough about in our DEI conversations thus far, but it's something that's come up as Kara, Ayana, and I have talked to affinity groups, those representing the international student body in the MBA program. There's a sense that we have tried to diversify the cases and make the cases more global, but if the person and if the majority of the students in the room don't have experience in that country, and if the case is dated, the conversation that we have around a country like Brazil, uh, which is a, is a common source of case studies in the MBA program, might just be a little bit reductive or a, limit, a little bit limited. Um, so that's one other way that we would like to see, that I would hope to see greater faculty diversity grow, going forward. Yeah, and I, I can add a, a different perspective and actually something that WEDIG is working on and uh, we have a, a bit of a, of a longer timeline for this because I know, as you know, uh, Team James developing a, a class and a syllabus and finding faculty sponsors uh, takes a, a bit of, of work. But um, one thing that is a big dream of mine, um, and as I mentioned, WeDig is working on is coming back as an alumni and seeing uh, Warden have maybe even also at the MBA level, a sort of social justice course. Um, and sort of understanding uh, in our conversations with, with other professors, um, even within the college, um, Professor Gillian mentioned like capitalism was built on inequality um, and slavery as we know in our country. Um, so acknowledging that, I think people forget that. Um, and just having a course that's like both historical and like application based and sort of learning about how has business contributed to uh, soci socioeconomic and racial inequality, ethnic inequality within our country? And what can we do to fix that? So first acknowledging that, learning about that history, and then you know, incorporating that warden project um, sort of element of things um, to say, okay, we know this now, what can we do to combat that? Um, and we've done research, I mean, other peer institutions have classes like this sort of like reimagining capitalism, um, solving these big problems. Um, so that's really a, a dream of mine. I think we're, we're in the works of also meeting with Vicene Robertson and finding a faculty sponsor for something like that. But I think um, to your point about how do we reach out to those people that are not self-selecting to be in these conversations and in these clubs and in professors' queries class, I think having something like that at Warden and potentially making it a, a requirement, even if it's a half credit course, I think that would be a fantastic way of doing that. Thank you for that. I think the last thing I would add is I would really like to see what Wharton does within the community as a whole, right? I think we 
sometimes get lost in our Wharton bubble. It's very easy to do so, right? Um, but we forget about Philly as a whole. Um, I can speak as one of very few people who live in West Philly from the NBA side of things. It is like the opposite side of the world when I talk to my classmates, right? And it's just because like Rittenhouse and Center City is just the area that everyone knows and is comfortable with. And we don't tend to kind of leave past that area and see what else is out there, right? So I would like for Wharton to just become a little bit more involved in the community um, when I look back in three to five years, I think I get this question a lot as an admissions fellow talking to perspectives like, well, what do you guys do with the black community? And I'm like, you know, we try. I think we, <laughs> we, ha we have efforts um, to, to be involved, but I definitely think we could do more there. And even having brief conversations with some of the undergrads over the last few weeks and understanding like their sense of community when they're walking out of Wharton in four years, it kind of, it touched my heart when someone told me they wish that they had the pride and joy that I had being a, a graduate of a historically black college university like North Carolina A&T. Like I light up when I talk about my undergrad institution, right? And they feel like they missed that. And they're, they're leaving this Wharton community to enter another one. And that'll be a gap that they have to fill, right? So I think like as a Wharton community, we need to like integrate into the Philly system. Well, I, I appreciate uh, all of those suggestions and, and um, thrilled that sort of we're on the right path because the, the groundwork that we're laying now is to precisely capture some of the suggestions that you have in place. So I think I just interrupted someone. No, 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 um, not at all. But I was just, I was just gonna ask a question after kind of saying that there's a lot of hopes from the student side and. From this talk it's evident that there's a lot that you're working on so what can we do as students to kind of bring people together across the campus to like talk on these pressing issues and to to get involved and work on them yeah well thank you and you're already doing it the fact that we're having this conversation now is certainly one example um but i i do really want to make sure that when i what, what i see of wharton isn't is an accurate reflection. And if, if there's a, a bifurcation and those who are sort of deeply uh, committed to the work around diversity and those who, you know, not resistant, but just aren't interested, then that's a way that our community is fragmented. And I, I love your help in understanding how, what are the areas where we can all come together and where there is consensus and that it may not be um, related to race or gender or sexuality or anything of that nature, but things that bring us together as a Wharton community that we can all enjoy and appreciate. So I, I welcome ideas and thoughts on, on that. Um, and then, you all will be the ambassadors of this brand. You are now and you will be even more so when you leave here. And to the extent that we're working to really uh, enhance Wharton's brand around the world, and part of your brand is how you present yourself in the context of diversity and, and creating inclusive environments, um, you represent the school and people our school will be judged on your actions, but you're also going to be exposed to so many people that might not be aware of what's available at Wharton. And so to the extent that you stay in touch with us and bring people into our community, either recommending them for students or um, opportunities to engage with us in, in other formats, uh, partnerships programs that we're starting, you'll, you'll learn next week, I can't say anything now, but you'll learn next week of a significant partnership that we're creating with another organization on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it will be a national initiative. Um, so stay tuned for that. But more of those ways, you're going to be going out to the workforce and your companies are going to be doing work around DEI. Well, how can Wharton play a role in facilitating the work of your organizations around this? So those kinds of things, I think, um, will be really critical to help us continue this engagement. We really appreciate that insight theme change. So now we're going to switch gear a little bit and get to the audience's questions. Um, our first question is to Dean James. 
Uh, Catherine wants you to elaborate a little bit more on what you were talking about when you mentioned vocabulary, the appropriate vocabulary for DEI that professors don't necessarily have. What is Wharton doing at the faculty level to train these professors to have these kinds of conversations more often? Yeah, so I wouldn't say that there's a, a dictionary of words that they need. It's more of a comfort level in opening up a conversation that um, will be productive in the context of the work that they are teaching in, in context of their, their academic expertise, right? Um, so for example, I'll take an economics professor who's you know, talking about the housing market and inequity in the housing market. Well, he or she can look at that from an academic perspective and sort of give you data connected to it. But if someone asks the question, well, what do you think about, you know, um, folks in West Philadelphia not having access to, to home loans and, and it, it, it gets a level, it gets to a level of personalization where they're going to have to communicate an opinion that feels risky sometimes because you don't want to inadvertently say the wrong thing or um, uh, uh, communicate something that is awkwardly stated and could be inferred or interpreted in a way that wasn't intended. And so I think what we find is that our faculty, and it's not just Wharton faculty, I think it's people in general, um, choose not to engage in those conversations to avoid potentially doing or saying something that can be misinterpreted. And that's the, the com confidence and culture that we have to create to allow grace in our conversations in class, to allow people to um, communicate authentically and to give people the benefit of the doubt that something that may be heard as antagonistic was not intended to be antagonistic. And so that's the kind of development that I'm working to create space for, for our faculty. But I also think there's a responsibility for our students uh, in those conversations as well to, um, to have that kind of grace as we're working and developing our skills to have difficult conversations around sensitive issues in, in a classroom setting. I love that, thank you so much. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, this question is from Jamal Wright. Uh, and I'm going to read it as he wrote it. Um, so as a Black Warden MBA, on the first week of my summer internship, I helped author an organization's public response to the death of George Floyd. In retrospect, I have thought much about the rise of performative allyship through surface level activism in the workplace and across social media. What is your advice to BIPIC who, who are called on in workplace environments to lend their insight and effort to advance DEI initiatives. Also, how do underrepresented professionals ensure that we are supporting authenticity and leadership and processes that reduce structural racism? That was a big one. <laughs> how, how much time do I have? <laughs> you have about five minutes. <laughs> easy. So easy. Thank you, Jamal. We appreciate it. Love it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll share what I can share. I don't obviously have, you know, all the wisdom on this really insightful question, but what I would say in terms of what is the responsibility of folks of color uh, in organizations where this work is needed, and oftentimes we're the ones called on to help facilitate, to help draft the communication, to help figure out what all the, you know, Latino or Latina employees are thinking and feeling and, and you know there's this need to sort of represent in a way that others aren't called to do. And I know firsthand, I, as I expect you all have experienced, that can become exhausting at times and it can be frustrating and, and it just places a different, an additional level of responsibility in addition to all the work that you have to do just to get your day job done. And we have two choices. We can either step up to that because if not us, who? Or we can step away from it and you know, not have our voice at the table as we're trying to um, 
build skills amongst our colleagues and build capacity and build capability and deepen relationships. So I, I believe we have to be at the table. I think that um, when there are moments that are overwhelming, like to me, even just talking about this now, and I know that George Floyd was, re was referenced in this question, I can't even, I can't turn on the news anymore because I am just at the surface of the emotion around what happened there. Um, so when we reach those points, I think we give ourselves permission to just step away and you know take the time that we need or the space that we need or whatever we need to, to not engage because doing so might actually be detrimental. Um, but, but when we have our reserves and when our tank is full and we're energized to do that work, I think, I think we're called to do that work. Um, your second question, how do unrepresented professionals ensure that we are supporting authenticity and leadership? Um, I think we only ensure it by modeling it. I, I think the more that we present authentically in our interactions and in our engagements, uh, that's the standard that we're setting for the people that are, are watching us. So we can't expect other people to engage and act authentically if we're not willing to do it ourselves. So. All right. Thank you so much, Jean James, for taking the time to speak to us. And thank you for everyone out there listening and watching. Uh, hopefully this conversation can set the tone for future conversations like this and at Wharton. And hopefully now more than ever, we can start to come together. Awesome. And I just want to plug quickly in the chat over there. Um, you'll see that uh, Ryan and Karen and Danny are having their We Dig Week. If you are an undergraduate, pop over to that chat and sign up for We Dig Week. Um, if you liked what you saw here and you want to talk more about it, if you have more thoughts, we're going to be doing that. Did you have to put, put that back up, Ryan? Put it up. Oh, that's, yep. He's a, yeah. he's a committed We Dig Dad over there. <laughs> um, and also, please fill out the survey. Um, it really helps us to figure out the programming for the following years and uh, and, and also let us speak to the administration about what you like and don't like. So please, please, please fill out the survey over there um, in the chat. And yes, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you to my fellow panelists um, for surfacing your beautiful insights. And thank you so much, Dean Erica James for joining us this evening. Thanks to all of you. Have a great evening. <laughs>